Right, if I could ask you to take your seats, please. Good afternoon, members. Could I ask you to take your seats? It is two o'clock, and we, we will, I'm sure, have quite a lot to get through this afternoon. Okay, so I'd just like to welcome you all here this afternoon. It's really good to see so many of you here, and I'd like to welcome um, the um, Health Board contingent. Dr. Philip Clear here on my left is going to give us a presentation, and then there'll be an opportunity for questions and answers from the floor. So um, I'd just like to say that although we are in the chamber and we are being webcast, this is not an official meeting of council, but it is a seminar stroke workshop. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Dr. Philip Clear. So thank, thank you very much for the welcome, uh, Chair, and also uh, thank you very much for the invitation and the opportunity to speak to you all uh, today as, as elected members. Um, also like to uh, welcome other members of the health board team who are sitting uh, around us and also uh, Rob Jeffrey from uh, Welsh Ambulance Service who's here to help answer questions with us because this is a whole uh, system uh, consultation. I think um, also we would have had other clinicians there uh, here today but uh, they are needed in the hospital at the moment. Um, if for those of you who saw the uh, webcast of our board meeting on the 19th of April, you'll have seen a lot of uh, clinicians uh, presenting uh, at, at that board. So, so thank you very much. Um, the, you'll see from the agenda that uh, there's a presentation and then an opportunity to ask uh, questions and for us to, to, to answer the questions and listen to your thoughts. Uh, there's also a workshop afterwards for, for an hour, an opportunity to go into more detail about the sort of concerns and questions that you might have and the feedback um, from your particular particular areas. So, um, look, this is a, this is a big moment uh, for this community, for health and care in this community. It's a big moment um, for each and every one of us uh, because if I was up to ask for uh, conflicts of interest at this moment, I suspect that nearly everybody would put their hands up because there are people, uh, councillors here who work for the health board. Uh, many of you will either uh, have relatives who work for the health board or have some other connection either with the health board or one of our major partners because health and care affects each and every one of us, our friends, our families, and every single one that we care for. And what we're suggesting, of course, are, are radical changes. And cha with change uh, brings uh, uncertainty and concern. And it's important, therefore, that we have the opportunity to be tested on um, those uh, on the changes. So, to some of the some of the reasons behind why we're proposing such uh, radical changes to our to our system are listed above behind me. The, the first one is one that we've struggled jointly to get to grips with, this 10-year difference in healthy life expectancy between the best off in society and the worst off. And that's been a feature for at least the last 15 years. And despite all of our collective efforts, we still have a 10-year difference in healthy life expectancy between the best off and the worst off. And it's a real challenge for us all to invest in those areas and those programs of work that would make a real difference uh, to people, often because the way our health and care systems are set up at the moment. The second challenge there is about demography-driven demand. And that's the fact that we've had the worst winter in health uh, that we've, we've ever known, the biggest challenges across the system in our hospitals, GP surgeries, community services, but also in social care. And that's not just us, that's across the whole of uh, westernized world. And that's because the elderly population is increasing. And we expect to see double the elderly population in the next 20 years. And so we need to get ourselves ready for that because we can't cope with the demography as it is at the moment. Then on top of that, we have challenges with, with recruitment and retention of staff. And of course, we need to provide a really good offer for future staff that's based on, that's competitive with other 
uh, organisations across the UK. So if we offer rotors that are more frequent than other um, organisations, or we offer rotors where there are lots of uh, locum and agency staff, of course, it's not that attractive for the future doctor, nurse, therapist, uh, care worker. And if we don't have the best facilities and the latest top technology, then again, that's not as attractive for the future nurses and doctors. And we need to be looking ahead the next 20, 10 to 20 years to make sure we are future-proofed in this area. And we recognize that, that with those people, they bring partners, who have other experience, not just in health, but they bring, have an effect on the local economy. So we recognize as an employer of 10,000 people that we have a big effect on the local economy. And as we're set up at the moment, we're not set up in a way we believe that best allows us to meet waiting times. Too many operations are canceled. Too many people wait too long because of the way uh, we're configured too many challenges for Welsh ambulance services. And the other challenge is about remoteness and rurality. And of course, in Pembrokeshire, here in Pembrokeshire, we have examples of that, particularly the coastal populations of Pembrokeshire. And they've been a feature in our thinking as we've developed our models with our clinicians and our staff and partners. And you'll hear more about that in, in a bit. So when we considered um, the sort of uh, our aspirations as a health board for our future health and care system. For those of you, most of you who've read the parliamentary review will have this been seen a call for a seamless approach between health and social care. That's been some, that's not new. That's been called for with, in lots of different ways, of course, for, for decades. But I, what I've seen and what others have seen, I think, is a much improved growing relationship between health and social care in this area, not least within this, this uh, county. We need to move much more towards us having joint ownership of our staff so we don't duplicate and we make the best uh, use of our resources. And what our clinicians are saying is that as we're configured at the moment, it's really difficult to provide the highest quality, safety and outcomes of, of care. And we're at a stage now where if, where if we proposed no change, that would be almost as significant and worrying for our staff as proposing change. When we had our board meeting a couple of weeks ago, a few, few weeks ago, one of the lead clinicians said, it feels like we're aspiring to mediocrity. And we should all worry about that because if we carry on as we are, a lot of our clinicians feel that we're aspiring to just about get on. And that's not enough. That's not good enough for all of us, given the fact, what I said earlier, it affects each and every one of us. We need to be aspiring to clinical excellence. And we believe that we can do that. And that will attract the future staff that will want to work in this area. We also, of course, therefore need to um, maintain our own staff. And of course, we don't want them to move, so we need to give them hope that there's a better uh, system. And we need to focus much more on prevention, self-management, and value for money. At the moment, as clinicians, every day, we see people coming to our hospitals who have, when you look at their history over the last six months to a year, there were things that we could have done, advice we could have given, support we could have given, that would have changed their life's course if we'd have been able to invest in, their, um, in that community in primary care. At the moment, our resource is locked in our hospital uh, system, and much of it in locum and agency staff, which we know don't provide the best quality care. And we need to make sure our people and our families are at the center of our decision making. So everything we do needs to be focused on patient-centered care, which is why this consultation is so important, going out and listening to hundreds of people, having those personal conversations already with people over the last four weeks about what actually matters to them. Because often it isn't what the doctor does, it's often some very simple things in their community, simple advice uh, that could be provided to really influence them. 
So these are the questions that we've, we've tried to address when we formed our models. We know that um, we need to base all of our, our services based on needs. So our public health director uh, performed a needs assessment of the whole of our system. But we know that the sort of things that are important to people are quality, i.e. Uh, a strive for clinical excellence, accessibility, value of our services. All of us need to more and more provide best value for money and sustainability. Because if we have a system in place that isn't sustainable for the future generation, because these changes aren't just for this generation, they're for the next generation and the one after, if we know in our heart of hearts it's not fit for them, then we've done them a disservice. And the words we've guided all of our, um, our uh, clinical services strategy uh, by have been safe, sustainable, accessible, and kind. And kind is important because in the end, a lot of things we do, sending someone for an appointment a long way away early in the morning isn't particularly kind. And you could all think of all sorts of examples where kindness is important. So we need to, it needs to pass the kindness test. So we've had a phased approach to our transforming clinical services program, three phases. The first phase was the discovery phase it, that, that was launched in June last year and uh, involved a period of engagement for three months uh, between uh, July and September. We took a, um, the feedback to our board in November during that time, we also had three clinically led groups running, which were looking at our own services and how our own services were functioning, but also looking at best practice across the world. What could we learn from the whole world? We took all of that report to our board in November, which is a matter of public record. And we know that um, we can't take a, sis a health system, health and care system from anywhere in the world and just um, inserted into our area because our geography is different. Everywhere the need is slightly different. So we need to take the best, take the best features from the best in, work in the world and make it a bespoke health and care services for our area, which is what we've tried to do. In no November, we, at our board meeting, we launched phase two, which was our design phase. And that phase move uh, is from December last year up until September 2018. As part of the design phase, we had a, a design group with clinicians generating our, our proposals. At one point, we had up to 27 proposals. Those were tested with various groups of clinicians and partners at many different events. And eventually, we got down to the three options we have now. And then we launched our consultation on the 19th of April. Phase three is the, the, the delivery phase, which of course um, is the critical phase when we deliver this. And we'll talk a bit about that in a minute. But you'll see from the timeline that we plan to, the consultation uh, continues until the 12th of July. We'll have a, a consultation report in August um, and then eventually take our proposed option to our board in September which will take account of all the feedback from partners, public, and staff. So it's unlikely that the, one of the proposals will be, that we'll choose exactly one of the proposals in exactly the way it is now. There's almost bound to be some change, some difference, some merging of options, depending on what we hear uh, from the public, given the amount of feedback. So we have three proposals, which I'll go through in a, in a minute. We have have um, constructed a family because when we tried to put, when we tried to talk about this in the past, um, it, it seemed abstract. Without it, without this family, so what we tried to do was construct a family that each and every one of us would recognise and all staff would recognise, where we could see our proposals through the lens of that family. And I say family because no one is a sort of individual without their friends, family, there's always some sort of social construct around that person. So anything that happens to any one of these individuals has an effect on the rest of them. So that I won't go through all of them, but each one has a backstory, each person, and each of them have various conditions that uh, fit with our population needs assessment. 
and you so if something happens to the lady in pink in the middle uh, mrs jones who's got early onset dementia it starts to affect mr jones because how does he cope and how does he care for her what support are we putting around them and how does the lady in green who is their daughter who's trying to run her do a job as a um, healthcare support worker how does she cope with that and then how does she also look after her daughter who's got pregnancy related problems who's on the right in the purple and so it goes on they've all they're all interconnected and those are the sort of issues that we face in health and care on a daily basis so just to go through the the areas that we felt were really important and were through each of our options are on the slide at the moment so first first um, part of it which is the key plank really is uh, delivery of services through a predominantly community model and by community we mean broad community model not just health multi-agency community model the other thing that we heard from our staff and all the test groups and our public was to separate planned and emergency care so that we don't have um, so many operations cancelled so urgent care patients in a plan care bed every time that happens and operations cancelled a disaster for that family and then if it's two days they're in a bed two operations cancelled three days three off and you scale that up across our system it's no wonder that each and every one of us knows people who've had some sort of delay to to a procedure the next bullet point is about an urgent care uh, being provided at a new urgent care hospital in the south of the health board between Narbeth and St Clair's fourth bullet point is about the presence of Bronglis hospital in each of the proposals because of its strategic importance and the fact that if it wasn't there some populations would be more than two hours away from any hospital so the next slide is about the things that are different in in our proposals first one is that plan care should either be delivered at the new purpose-built site but of course architecturally separated from the urgent care build so you couldn't have them in the same building otherwise urgent care patients would end up in the planned care beds again so we'd have to work on that if you put the but it but in the proposal C that's proposal A and B in proposal C plan care is provided at a repurposed Glangwilly site separate from the urgent care so the advantage of that is that they're separate so you can uh, virtually guarantee the plan care operations the disadvantages are that you split your workforce and you have the costs of two sites and the costs of splitting your workforce so there are trade-offs in this for all of us the public and, us, and the health board so the next bullet point is about Prince Philip Hospital either being a local general hospital in proposals B and C or a community hospital in proposal A in proposal A as a community hospital it has the advantage of having a bespoke approach to rehabilitation when you have nurse led care therapy led care for those 40% of people who are in our beds all of our hospital beds at the moment who don't need to be in an acute hospital and need nurse and therapy directed care they don't need a doctor like me but at the moment the care is mixed between community and acute care and nobody gets the best uh, the best deal the other two options are about it being a local general hospital implications to flow with flow to Morrison Hospital in the fourth bullet point availability of beds at Glang William Withybush as community hospitals changes the community beds at Ammon Valley and South Thames hospitals so our proposed model for the community is that built up from its workforce because the buildings of course and facilities are important but it's the workforce that is the real jewel and the most important thing to get right so our proposal is for a multi-agency community network which will be which will be our health staff doctors nurses therapists healthcare support workers domiciliary carers from our local authority other workers from local authority also needs to include our third sector partners and other agencies 
So other agencies have a key role uh, to play. And a lot of their focus will be on prevention. So we, need, we will risk assess our whole population. We know who's got frailty, chronic conditions, end of life dementia. The challenge is having a proactive plan for each and every one of those people with frailty, end of life, chronic conditions, and uh, dementia. We will have community hubs where that workforce will be located. It will be a focus for them to work together and provide additional tests, advice, support, and some treatments. But remembering that on that picture behind me, the exercise class, some of the civic halls, are at least as important as the community hub because we need to, um, we need to press for healthy aging for all of us, which isn't, as I said before, about the inhaler that I prescribe as a chess consultant. So in some of the models, though, we have, uh, at the higher end, we have community hospitals. So at um, Withybush Hospital, in this model, there would be enhanced services above the level of a community hub. So in Withybush, for example, we would have community beds where the 40% of people who don't need to be in acute people an acute hospital would have their therapy. They would have their uh, rehabilitation and reablement treatment. So they would only need to be in the acute hospital for a very short time for their once in a lifetime illness and then they would move back to Withybush Community Hospital in Pembrokeshire for their rehabilitation and reablement. And they'd have a multi-agency approach which would mean they wouldn't need to stay there for as long as they do, they do now. In addition, at Withybush Community Hospital, we would have minor injuries where we would deal with a whole range of conditions, including uh, fractures, um, minor illnesses. Of course, major fractures, you'd have to go to the acute hospital if you need an operation and overnight stay. But the vast majority could be dealt with uh, locally. In addition, we'd have the midwifery lead unit, um, endoscopy, day case surgery, uh, outpatients, dialysis unit, a whole range of services at Withybush Hospital for our population to, to access services there. So you'd only have to go to the, to the main hospital if you either need that big operation or you have a really serious illness. So in our, in our uh, proposal for community hubs, you can see a range of community hubs. We've already had a lot of feedback from our public. You can see in the South Pembroke Dock in Tenby, which you'll recognize in for Pembrokeshire. I won't talk about all the other hubs necessarily because I'm in Pembrokeshire, um, but they all have, uh, they're all important to those communities. One of the bits of feedback that we've had quite strongly is that because we split our localities into South and North Pembrokeshire is the absence of a community, community hub in North Pembrokeshire. We've taken a lot of feedback on that and that's something that we need to reflect on because when we look at um, North Pembrokeshire, there are some really strategically important locations. And of course, what this um, map doesn't show, and I'd need the map, a map as big as this wall to show all of the community assets, all the GP surgeries, mental health facilities, uh, local authority facilities, for example, in North and South Pembrokeshire. Um, but, but, there are some facilities, Fishguard, Solver, St. David, Goodit, and of course, um, there's uh, Broker Selly as well. So we're looking at that. So for, for proposal A, just to go through the three proposals, all of them, when I, when I start to get to the proposals where the hospitals are there, immediately it's easy to forget the, um, the fact that the whole of this uh, proposal is based on a transformed community and primary care system with a multi-agency community network supported by community hubs in each of these proposals because it won't work unless we have that in place for our aging population. So in proposal A, in addition, Bronglice Hospital is there as it is in each of the proposals and there is a new acute and planned care hospital between Narbeth and St. Clair's. In Withybush, Glanguilly, and Prince Philip, we would have community hospitals 
as I described earlier, with that long list of services uh, in the community hospitals. And at the moment, for people of uh, rural Pembrokeshire, they're travelling to Glanguilly as their acute hospital, not only for obstetrics, paediatrics and neonates, but also for a whole range of other emergency presentations. These include um, upper GI bleeding, vomiting blood, a relatively common occurrence, have to go to Glanguilly, but also for urology, ENT, also card some cardiac procedures and some respiratory procedures, you have to go all the way to Glanguilly. So in this model, with this new hospital, those emergency presentations would be brought much closer to the, to the coast. And in that facility, we would have our A&E, critical care, it would be our trauma unit, we'd have the whole range of surgical specialties, the whole range of medical specialties, and given the fact we only have two A&E consultants in Withybush and two in Glanguilly, we would be able to start to have a critical mass of A&E consultants. And where this has been done in, in other areas, they've had waiting lists of A&E consultants. And this isn't just about A&E, other, um, other specialties also have similar challenges with locum and agency staff, where the locum staff outnumber the permanent staff. So in proposal B, everything I said just earlier, but Clonethley is no longer a community hospital, it's a local general hospital. In proposal C, we split urgent and planned care. So the urgent hospital is between Narbeth and St. Clair's. We have a planned care hospital at Glanguilly. Clonethley is a local general hospital and Bronglice is, is there. So if we, um, in, that in that option, we have four hospitals. And the more hospitals we have, the more costly it is to run and the less money we have for primary and community care. So again, some of the trade-offs we need to consider. So in mental health, I'm gonna, we're running slightly out of time, so I'm gonna skip to this slide where we've just gone through a really uh, important mental health consultation and we're aligning this consultation with the mental health consultation. And two of the key outputs of that our co-location of mental health facilities with community hubs and also the fact that we want to co-locate our mental health treatment and assessment units um, with the new hospital because there's a co important codependency with the acute services. So they will be together and it's important we, um, we it, it, that means they are moving closer to the rural coastal Pembrokeshire. So, Libby, just for the last couple of slides, I'm going to hand over to Libby, who's our Transformation Director, and then there'll be opportunities to ask questions. Good afternoon. Um, our work through Phase 1 and Phase 2 has been underpinned by a large amount of technical work to inform the proposals that uh, Phil has just presented to you. Um, a lot of work around understanding our local uh, population health needs to determine the proposals alongside looking at transport and drive times, our digital infrastructure, our workforce and understanding the impacts and opportunities and our estate. In terms of our staff, um, we recognise that these proposals um, are significant and therefore that this will have a significant uh, effect on our staff but also provide huge opportunities in, in terms of new ways of working and new roles um, and changes to the environment within uh, which many of our staff may, may be working in the future. However, we also acknowledge that there will be changes uh, and impacts in terms of travel times um, from where our staff live, some closer, um, but some also further away. One of our key ambitions around delivering our services through these proposals in the future is making best use of um, available IT uh, infrastructure and looking very differently at how people can access services in the future with a focus on uh, accessing services remotely 
um, to uh, reduce the amount of travel where, where, that's, where that's possible. So with our proposals, obviously, as well as opportunities, there, there are a number of, of risks. And as I've already said, um, given that this is a whole system uh, transformation, that there are high numbers uh, of staff that will be affected by um, the proposals, um, but uh, not only negatively, but also in terms of opportunities as well. When um, uh, services go through changes uh, of this scale, um, that there is a risk that that impacts on um, uh, maintaining and recruiting staff to the area, but also um, in contrast, with a, a clear vision for the future of delivering services and the potential for new services being delivered differently, this also can serve to attract staff to, to the area as well. So in terms of some of the key opportunities that these proposals um, give us uh, as an organization, obviously within our proposals, as you can see, there, there is a, a new hospital, whether that's an urgent care hospital or an urgent and planned care hospital. Um, and as uh, Phil has already uh, mentioned, providing much better facilities uh, and more um, uh, state-of-the-art facilities for our clinicians to work within. Also, the um, opportunity, as I've already said, for new and expanded roles and developing and training our staff to work differently and also in integrated roles across organizations with the opportunity for different uh, career development uh, and training. And also, I've already mentioned about IT, but there, there really are many, many opportunities to deliver services differently, uh, working remotely and linking our very remote communities to our um, key clinical centers. Um, as you will be aware, we have um, a duty under the Equalities Act um, to consider the impacts of these proposals on our work um, against those groups within our society who are, who are most vulnerable within our population. And therefore, as part of the work that we uh, have undertaken to develop these proposals, we have undertaken both equality impact assessment and integrated impact assessment um, on these proposals. And we will continue to do so in response to what we're hearing um, from the conversations that we're having with our local populations. In terms of the consultation itself and how um, we've approached the consultation, uh, we really do want to hear uh, as many and wide-ranging uh, voices to um, influence and, and uh, help us to determine the final recommendation that we will be making to the Health Board later this year. So we've taken a very broad and varied approach to this um, from online methods, um, producing documents which uh, you have copies of, very large document, um, but also different versions of, of key documents using videos and animation, um, using social media, um, and really we've been open to, um, to approach the consultation in as, in as creative way as we can to ensure that we hear as many voices as we can. In terms of the, the documents themselves, we have to produce formal documents as part of the consultation under the uh, Welsh Government guidance on engagement and consultation. So as you see, we've got the very big uh, consultation document. As a summary of that, we actually created a six minute animation, um, which hopefully we'll, we'll be able to show that to you as we go into the, uh, into the workshop later on this afternoon. We've also provide, produced uh, an easy read version of the document um, and uh, the questionnaire, which we'll also uh, provide for you as well. The whole of the suite of documents then are all also underpinned by um, a large number of very technical documents for those people who really want to go through all the detailed underpinning um, technical detail um, of the proposals. And these are all available on our um, of our website. Um, in addition to that, um, we have a, a web resource which you can see there. And what we're doing constantly as we're engaging through events is we're keeping um, a set of frequently asked questions and answers updated on the website. 
um, so that as we're, we're hearing those questions, we're able to put those answers straight out onto our website. Um, we've been working very closely with, with uh, the media locally and nationally and make sure that we're providing regular updates and releases through the media. We're using uh, social media, as I said, um, and also non-digital, more traditional methods with posters and flyers in all our local um, community facilities and in waiting areas and, and GP practices, etc. Um, we are signposting people in a number of ways, as you can see there. So there's the traditional questionnaire, which can be done uh, in paper um, and sent in, to, in free post or that can be done online as well. Um, we're also welcoming uh, and encouraging people to contact us either by email, if you don't want to fill in the questionnaire, just with comments um, and feedback, but also we have a phone line um, that's available uh, during the day as well. Um, and we've got our uh, usual social media routes as well where people can get in touch. Thanks very much. Hand over to Natasha. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Kerr and Libby, for that um, informative presentation. I've had a few members who've already indicated that they'd like to ask a question. So if you can just, I'll ask um, Councillor Howlett to, to kick us off, please. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Tessa, and um, thank you for coming uh, today um, and for allowing us to be in webcast. I I've been through the technical documents, and I want to intersperse my questions with a few facts I've had from the technical documents. I would say I accept the, the, the need for change, but I think it's just important and fair to each constituent part of the Howard Eye area that each county is, is thought of. Now, all three of your proposals at present are based on a new hospital. And I see, Mr. Clare, that you're, you're, already comment, you're already quoting the papers to give hints that that new hospital will be closer to the east than the west, which clearly is, is not good news for the people of Pembrokeshire. Um, I'm skeptical of the delivery of such a new hospital. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary has given no indication that there's, there's money available for it. And also we need to look at the Cumbran Hospital project, I, I feel. First talked about in 2004 and due to be open in 2022. Now if that's replicated, I'll be well into my retirement age using this, this new hospital. I see from your presentation um, you're talking about delivery by 2025. I will be quite frankly amazed if that actually happens. Um, and, of course, look at the track record of the health board for taking services away, neonatal, some neonatal and special care baby unit services, on the assumption that new services are going to be in this case in Glanguilly. The funding was only agreed last, last month for that. So my first question is, given the track record and the experience of the, the Cumbran Hospital, I wonder, could you outline how any of these proposed options will help you in the short or the medium term? Um, turning to the technical documents, the estates and buildings document, I, I was shocked to read that um, there's a, a backlog of maintenance of your four hospitals, £61 million. Pounds. I think the health board needs to have a look at look how that got to that, that, that amount. Willie Bush is £11 million, uh, which is dwarfed by Glanguilly backlog of £22 million. Um, and of course, I, I was also very surprised to see Glanguilly has got no adequate gas supply. So uh, it also mentions car parking, which clearly for anyone who uses any of the hospitals is a, is a big issue. Another interesting fact that I saw was the, what's called the hard and soft estate facilities costs, which include maintenance, utilities, waste, business rates, cleaning, laundry, and portering costs. Now, the, the Prince Philip, Glanguilly, and Bronglais range from £179 per square metre or I should say £168 per square metre to £179 per square metre. Willybush is significantly lower, £136 per square metre. So my second question is, surely it's better to invest in a hospital with less cost per square metre of uh, costs, and that has got in your report the actual room to, to expand. So, you know, in, in summary, I would say, I would say that um, Withybush Hospital serves a large population, some on the coastal fringe, as you have mentioned, with massively increased population in the summer, ferry ports and industry. Your own report acknowledges both the development potential at Withybush and that it is by far the current hospital with the lowest cost. Whilst I acknowledge changes needed, please don't dis disproportionately affect the people of Pembrokeshire. And my third question, 
given what I would say is a big question about the deliverability of a new hospital, is it not time to go back to the drawing board with your, your consultation? Thank you, Councillor Handler. Um, three questions there. Take, take each one in turn, Yeah, I'll try to. And there's a, there's a few sort of sub-questions in, in the middle, I think, probably. Uh, so, so I think perhaps the first the first point was um, was about how, is this deliverable? When would it be deliverable? Um, I think. Look, we we have to go through a business case development process, which um, would be the same for every public sector organisation to be able to secure capital money. And before we do that, of course, um, the um, Welsh Government can't um, announce the money because they need the business case. The problem is the business case, of course, costs quite a bit of money and we can't prejudge the consultation part because we, we need to listen to everybody's views. So there's a chicken and egg is issue with that. Um, I suppose in terms of the delivery of the, of the programme, the, the whole strategy isn't just based on, on the new build. Actually, it's based on a transformed community and primary care system. And I think that is the um, area of the system that needs work immediately and needs to be in place by the time a new build happens. My, um, my, I appreciate the, the experience in uh, East Wales, in the Gwent, um, although there are other experiences across the UK where um, new builds have been much quicker when there's been a very clear um, strategy uh, in place. In terms of the location, which I would say is one of the, the, um, the sort of sub-questions in there, um, this is an important point, so I'm glad, you, glad you've raised it. There, there, is a, there is, of course, a re the whole reason that we aren't uh, proposing to, um, for, the, for Glanguilly Hospital or Carmarthen to be the site of the acute hospital is the rural coastal Pembrokeshire population. So it's important that we bring those services that currently people have to travel to Glanguilly for much closer to the coast. And it's important that those services aren't located, the hospital isn't located too far east. The issue though is in the same, uh, the, the same sort of concern for the population of North Carmarthenshire, but also an even perhaps more important concern would be that if we move the hospital too far west, there are some specialties where you need a certain amount of throughput for that specialty to be sustainable. And that means for the doctors, either in training or in their daily work, to see enough of the complex cases to keep them upskilled. And whilst we might celebrate the opening of a, a specialist centre a long way west, in our hearts we'd know that quite a number of those specialties would become unsustainable within the future years, the, you know, a few years. And that would be, we'd do a big disservice for our population if that was to happen, because the worry would be that if the new site became unsustainable, then that would mean that not only would the coastal population have to travel to that hospital, actually they'd have to travel much further all the way to Morriston. So for us all, it's really important that the location of the hospital is at a place where there'll be enough activity for some really key specialties, such as obstetrics and pediatrics, so that the future deanery, the future regulators, the future colleges and doctors and nurses and health board wouldn't feel they had to shut services. On your other, sorry, so on the other questions, look, the, the estate is an issue. That's part, that's part of the driver for change, as, as there are many, many drivers for change. Again, Glanguilly, um, there, are, there are areas of Glanguilly that we've, we've said are extremely outdated and don't lend themselves to us being able to um, run the most modern services, and that's a key factor in this. But I've just said that if we move all of those services all the way to Withybush, there'd be a real concern that we wouldn't have enough activity to maintain those doctors and we wouldn't attract the staff and the trainees in the future. So the last question was, should I go back to the drawing board? And, you know, I suppose, look, we haven't finished our consultation yet and we need to hear everyone's views. Your views are really key because you represent the, the population. We really do need to listen to everyone. Uh, next, I've got Councillor Simon Hancock. 
Thank you. Um, just a couple of questions. The shift to community services is clearly, you know, quite fundamental. Working with the three local authorities, I know the three local authorities, Pembrokeshire, Kerrydigan and Carmarthen, have already, there's a large amount of collaborative work through the West Wales Care Partnership. What sort of changes will you require to make this vision a reality? What sort of, what sort of vision, what sort of changes will the local authorities themselves have to make? Because obviously the depth, the pace, and the, the sheer scale of this change is, is remarkable. And uh, so what will you require of the local authorities? Because clearly they are central to making the community vision a reality. Thank you. So as you say, this is, this is key to it, um, key to the whole, the whole of this model. Um, we're working at the moment with um, all of the local authorities, all the directors of ser social services, very closely on a bid for the transformation fund. The cabinet secretary announced a 100 million uh, transformation fund. It, the only, the, the most compelling bid, I think, for the transformation fund will be one that's a completely joint bid, that is specific about some of the services that we'd want to invest in, that aren't just health services. We need to be focused on prevention, early intervention. Also, um, we need to signal how not only we make um, best of the pool budgets arrangements, but I think also how we manage our staff, because our, our staff at the moment, um, it's, well, the experience of our public is often that you'll see a domiciliary carer for half an hour who attends to one bit of you, and then a healthcare worker turns up half an hour later and tends to another bit of you. And really, there was no reason why each of them couldn't be trained to do the same thing. So the, at the moment, that is an incredible waste of resources. Um, and that's happening every day in our communities. So we do need to work much, much more closely together. And there needs to be joint ownership and education of health and social care staff in the community. Thank you, Dr. Moore. Um, next, I've got Councillor David Bryan. Thank you very much. A, a keystone of this plan is the new build, wherever that may be, Whitland, Carmarthen, whatever. But the timescales on this vary between 7 and 15 years, if anything. Which other services do you propose or do you envisage taking away from Whittybush before that new build takes place? So, um, in terms of, I think you mentioned that it could be in Carmarthen, this new build. It's between uh, Narbeth and I just thought I'd, I, sh I should respond to it. Uh, you've heard this presentation five or six times now, so poor you. So with, there's um, the, the, the proposal has been carefully, uh, we've carefully looked at travel times, population need and population density, which is why the zone is between Narbeth and St. Clair's. In terms of are there any plans to change services or remove services from Withybush or Glangwilly in, in the meantime? Um, there are no plans to move services in the meantime. The only thing I would say, though, is that the whole, uh, well, part of the basis for the consultation has been that we have real challenges with sustainability of our services. And when you're dependent on either one or two permanent members of staff in some departments, I can't absolutely guarantee on an operational basis over the next five to seven years, which is the time scale you mentioned, the changes might not have to happen. Having said that, we need all the permanent members of staff we've got and more to staff the new hospital. We just don't need the locum and agency staff. So what we will be doing in the transition period whilst moving towards this new model is recruiting really hard to the new model for people who want to help and be involved in building that new service model. Because not many people in their careers have that opportunity, so it is an exciting opportunity for many people to either be part of a new community and primary care model that's state of the art and is at the crest of the wave, meeting the needs of the future demographic, but also be a specialist who's involved in creating that new hospital environment. So we have no plans to change any services in the meantime, but you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, we're going to face some big challenges over the next five to seven years. Can you explain to me what the difference is between a local general hospital and a community hospital, and why 
nationally it's been considered as a local general hospital and not Withybush. And also, what I want to know is what the maximum recommended travel time is in both time and distance from uh, a major care centre for access emergency. So the difference between the local general hospital and the community hospital is that at Clenethley, in the local general hospital, there would be um, not only the minor injuries unit, but an acute medical unit, which would include um, a range of acute medical specialties, including cardiology, respiratory, endocrinology, elderly care, and gastroenterology. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a choice here for us, because if, if we were to not provide that at Clenethley, then a lot of the population would inevitably have their closest hospital in Morriston. So we would have to commission an, a services for a proportion of those that population currently going to Clenethley in Morriston Hospital, and we'd have to be clear that we'd able to be able to, um, we'd be able to commission that at the same quality and for the same cost for our population as we can at uh, Clenethley. Also, there's, there's an option for Clenethley, because in some ways, some would argue that for those 40% of people needing rehabilitation, some would say that's an underestimate, but those 40% of people who are, need reablement and rehabilitation, if that was provided through a community hospital environment, actually they would have a higher standard of care if it wasn't a local general hospital. I realize that there's a strength of feeling also in Clenethley with that. For, so for, for Withybush, if we try and provide it also in Withybush, we would, I think, struggle to maintain those services. Also, we believe that our, um, our issue is between Withybush and Glangwilly trying to run both of those services. And Withybush would then benefit from the community hospital with all those services that I've, uh, that I've described. The other question was about maximum um, travel times. We, when we've looked at this, and I might come to Rob Jeffrey from the ambulance service, when we've, um, the moment it ranges for different conditions. So at the moment, if you have a type of heart attack in Dale, Goodit, Fishguard, St. David, Solver, any of Milford, wherever, um, then you have to go to Morriston for your percutaneous, primary percutaneous angiography. So in a way, it, it's not, um, it, it, there are different timescales for different conditions. I would say, though, that what we try to do with our mapping is provide a service that is as close within an hour of the vast majority of populations. And then we're looking at for those services where those, those populations where they're just outside the hour, working with Welsh Ambulance to provide an enhanced response because treatment in those communities starts at the point of the phone call and the arrival of the first responder. It's not as simple as the time to the, to the hospital. I don't know whether this had, if you had yes, to hand up to me. Thanks, thanks very much. Uh, picking up on what uh, Phil said, um, each condition um, has a different parameter. So for example, as Phil said, uh, for, for a heart attack, um, what we class as door to needle time is, is 90 minutes. So we need to get the patient to Morrison within uh, 90 minutes. Um, I'm sure uh, a question will come around um, the golden hour, which came uh, about uh, in the mid 80s. Um, you know, uh, modern paramedicine would argue now that um, treatment uh, starts at the time uh, that we receive the call. So we have a, we have a clinical desk in each of our three clinical con uh, contact centers. Um, the skills that uh, paramedicine, uh, if you use, I guess, use me as the best example, I suppose, um, I qualified as a paramedic in uh, 1991, and I was classed as a, an ambulance driver with a few added skills. Um, now we're in 2018. Uh, paramedics uh, now have a two-year university course. Our advanced practitioners have a three-year master's course. Uh, it's just gone through legislation um, that paramedics now will be able to independently prescribe. Um, I think what really does underpin this consultation by the time we get uh, to, the, to the new build uh, is that certainly our emergency uh, medical retrieval service, the, the helicopters, absolutely would need to be flying 24-7. Uh, we currently have four uh, uh, 
and uh, helicopters uh, currently in operation. And I know uh, from my own experience uh, in uh, the central and west area, uh, provisional training for night flying uh, has already uh, commenced. So I think some considerable time before um, we arrive at the final option, uh, the air ambulance will be flying 24-7, uh, which is key. And I guess from the other uh, point of view, because I think the issue is that there's several aspects to this, and certainly uh, our advanced uh, paramedic practitioners already work in out of hours. They already rotate in, in primary care. And certainly when we get, come to the health hubs, uh, the, des the desire from the, from the ambulance trust is that our advanced practitioners will be based in the hubs and working with GP practices. We've also then got critical care paramedics. Uh, as you may be aware, the helicopter now runs with a consultant or a registrar in emergency care uh, on, on it 12 hours a day. Um, but as I said, the key to this is actually running it 24-7, particularly on the coastal areas. Next question then, please, from Councillor David Lloyd. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this actually is very similar to the question of Mark Carter, who's from Solver. I'm from St. David's. And I was asking whether a criterion had been applied uh, relating to the location of the community hubs, uh, relating to the maximum distance from hubs for people to access. And on the face of it, the St. David's Peninsula has been singularly disadvantaged. Now, I heard earlier when you opened that you've had representations on this matter before, and I would like to know whether this is going to be addressed, because on the face of it, if you want the support of communities, the underlying principle must be equity of provision. And at present, there is no equity for the St. David's Peninsula. I suppose at the moment, my, we've, we've had St. David's very much in our mind, as well as Fishguard, Goodick, and all those all those coastal communities. And at the moment, from St. David's, we're really conscious that there's a lot of uh, presentations at the moment where um, people have to travel all the way to Glanguilly. Um, and actually, I suppose in the new, in the new model of care. Um, there'll be almost as many conditions where you'll be traveling less distance as there would be traveling a bit further down the, a, the A40. The other point I would say is that the vast majority of things would be still dealt with locally, either at the community <coughs> hospital or um, within your community. It would only be when you have your um, life-threatening illness that you'd have to go to the, to the acute hospital. I, I realize in the end, you know, ideally, if we... Um, we'd have an acute hospital every community and you know that that's very very difficult to achieve what we're trying to do is bring as many services closer to those rural coastal communities in a way that is sustainable the concern would be that if we move them to even further west than sort of the, the zone that we've we've suggested that we will not have sustainable obstetrics or pediatric services and actually the populations of St. David's, Solver, etc. would have the most to lose in that situation because we could end up with a hospital down the line, not very far down the line, which doesn't have sustainable services. And then there's all the threat that goes on for the next generations to deal with. So that's our concern. Um, I, I realise that, that the, we, we're, we're as concerned about the coastal population of Pembrokeshire, which is why the hospital isn't being considered at Glangully. Thank you. Um, then the next question, please, from Councillor Sam Kurtz. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, firstly, can I commend the Health Board for coming here today and uh, engaging with us? And also, I attended the uh, drop-in event in Leicester last Tuesday. Uh, fantastic event, I, I must say. Uh, very well attended, which I think goes to show the amount of uh, strong feeling in North Pembroke Pembrokeshire for uh, the proposals. Um, just to echo what Councillor uh, Brian has said, really, uh, if funding is secured for this and the bill does go ahead, the guarantee that services from Withybush aren't lost eastwards is of a huge concerning factor to those residents here in Pembrokeshire. If any service, especially A&E, were to make its way down the A40 towards Carmarthen while that bill is underway, that would put a lot of strain on a lot of people here in Pembrokeshire. And I think that is a real strong factor in consideration on this. I have uh, completed the consultation. I've added that, uh, especially on there, that ensuring that A&E especially is remained open at Withybush while the new build, if funding is secured for it, 
is built. Thank you, Councillor Cook. Do you want to restate your position yeah. on that? Uh, yeah, I can do. So there are, there are no plans to move the ANU unit. And in fact, during that time, we will be trying to recruit to the, um, the vacant posts that there are in, in A&E because we will need them in the future model. And we, need to, we want new people to come and help us design the future model. That'll be, that's our plan, um, to reduce that locum and agency bill. And we, we think actually with this, with this uh, model, the hope of the new model, that will bring people to come and work with us as long as all of us are, it, it's um, of interest to all of us, I suppose. If, if there are things in the press that are really negative and continue negative, I suppose, then if you're a junior doctor or nurse or therapist thinking of coming working down here and you just Google um, to see negativity, then you'll move on and move to another, find another area. Thank you. Um, I'll have next Councillor Pat Davis and then Michelle Bateman and then Councillor Jamie Adams. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. It was very well presented. Thank you very much. Although you only briefly touched transforming mental health, I wonder if you could tell me, are there any discussions taking place or any intentions for any specialist units to be put within the authority? Uh, I'm particularly thinking about a CAMS unit, which, you know, uh, in view of the, the rising problems of mental health amongst our young people, I wonder, are, are there any intentions um, where would you propose aiming, uh, directing those services to? Okay, just um, to respond generally around transforming mental health first before I come on to the, uh, your issue about CAMS particularly. Um, the outcome of the consultation that we um, undertook last year um, was to have uh, a designated assessment unit and treatment unit, which as Phil has, has already um, referred to, um, we've aligned with um, the development of the, of the new hospital within each of the proposals. But within each of the communities, what we heard very strongly from uh, people who use our services is that actually hospital for them is very much a last resort. They want to be looked after and cared for near their communities and their families and, and friends. So as part of the proposals of transforming mental health, um, the outcome was to develop a 24-hour mental health centre center, um, with what are called recovery or crisis beds uh, in a much more homely environment um, uh, in, in uh, key places within our, our localities in Pembrokeshire, Ceredigion and Carmarthenshire, um, which our board then signed off at the end of the consultation. So those developments are now in train to plan for implementing community mental health centres with crisis and, and recovery beds more locally. Um, those uh, centres um, are very much along the same ethos that we've talked about in that it isn't only about delivery from health but with our partners and particularly linking with our third sector as well who provide a uh, a huge range of services around um, uh, emotional and mental well-being. In terms of CAM specifically, we as a, as a health board, we have to provide age-appropriate beds within our um, current inpatient services. Therefore, we have to have, um, you know, not, not only provide adult beds, but to have that. Um, obviously, within the developments of uh, both the assessment and treatment units and the community mental health centres, Part of that will be considering not only the needs of adults, but also the needs of our um, children and young people as well as part of that. Thank you. Then I have um, Councillor Michelle Bateman. Thank you, Councillor Hodgson. Recruitment plays quite a large part in this consultation document. Um, now, it could be said that the long-standing uncertainty around the future of Withybush might have played a part in some of those recruitment issues. But what makes you feel confident that you could recruit the required numbers for the new hospital? I know at the Letterston event last week, I heard a lot of comments around the rotors available and also um, the, the desire for doctors to be able to specialise more in their chosen field. Um, secondly, there's been a lot of talk around the cost of the new hospital, but it seems to me that there's going to be almost as much investment needed in the community hubs and the community services. So I just wonder if any kind of costing has been done around the investment needed there. 
And thirdly, just a yes or no answer, do the Health Board own any land currently between Narbeth and St. Clair's? Thank you. <clears throat> so, uh, let me start. So, recruitment. Um, so, on that, what the experience of other places actually has been when they've, when they've, um, when there's a new build which has all the latest facilities, technology, hopefully at least paper light, ideally paperless, um, cardiac cath lab, etc. all of those things within it, then actually staff want to come and work there, not only um, trained staff, but also trainees. We'd also propose to have a health education center and an academic center at, on that base, and we've had some discussions with the medical schools, human health sciences who train the nurses and uh, therapists, and they've shown interest in connecting with us at, uh, at the new build. Um, and you know, with all of that, then people do want to work in those areas where they have the latest facilities and latest technology. Also, you're right that who, people who are on a one in two rotor, it means that they're working every other day unless we employ locum and agency staff. So not many people want to come and work, uh, be the next person in and be sort of on a one in three rotor when the further east you go, you could be on a one in 11, sometimes one in 20 rotor. So it's not surprising that we struggle to get people to work on what we think are very generous rotors. When I look back in my career, thinking, gosh, that's a really generous rotor, one in six or one in eight rotor, but actually, the, the market we're in is that you need, that, that people will have that opportunity to work on a one in 20 rotor. In addition, trainees have to these days be on a one in 11 rotor. So they're on call one in 11 days and one in 11 weekends. That's standard really across um, certainly our deanery and other areas. So it's one in 11 weekends. That's to so that they maintain their educational component of their, of their work. We just cannot provide that everywhere but we would be able to in the, in the new build and the new arrangements. And the, the deanery then will be able to send us more trainees, we would think. So and it's not just about doctors at schools, about therapists and nurses. And in the end, if we have a community model that we can invest in, then actually community teams should, uh, community workforce should want to come and work with us. That's, so we, we strongly believe that. We think it's a compelling case that people will want to come. Second question was about community hubs. That has to be part of the business case development. We haven't done any detailed modeling around exactly what, what, what it would cost to provide the community hubs. In fact, of course, we're listening very hard as about what, what sort of services would need to be within those community hubs, and in fact, even the location of them. So the detailed work on that will happen uh, during the delivery phase. And on the last question, I am not aware that the health board is, has any land between Narbeth and St. Clair's. We do not, good. Well, there we are. My colleagues say we do not. <laughs> Just checking, it's not being hidden from me. <laughs> good. Thank you, thank you. And next, uh, Councillor Jamie Adams. Also, hello. There we are, thank you. And thanks for your attendance today. Appreciate it very much. Um, a mixed bag for me because uh, health will touch everybody's lives at some point um, and the older people get the more it touches those lives um, many people will want to have service as close to home as possible um, but for obvious reasons when push comes to shove they want the very best health care regardless of where it is so whilst the emotive argument around Withybush is always one that gets the headlines and probably gets the, gets the numbers behind it. I think, I think the uh, conversation has to move on a little and people have to um, understand that safe and secure health services are more important than where they are located. That said, it's clear that there's an economic argument to retain services and jobs within a county and that shouldn't be overlooked as well um, and also I think there's a uh, an unquestioning difficulty for this county in terms of our geography you've heard from other members who live in more coastal areas than I do about the difficulty of accessing services 
and, and transport, where, whether it be planned or emergency, cannot be overlooked because you can have the very best services, but if people can't get there, then that's another problem. So, Rob, thank you for the help with um, understanding the helicopter element because if we are to relocate major services in Pembrokeshire, helicopters will have to play a role in terms of supporting our coastal communities. Um, one of the things perhaps that I wanted to move the conversation on a little to is a retired GP has recently suggested that um, rather than uh, going it alone as Howells are, possibly a tie-up with ABNU may be a way of ensuring that we reach the required throughput that you've spoken about, Andy. We satisfy the demands of deanery. Um, so is that an option? And if it's not, why is it that we have to have um, consultants who are wholly employed by Howells are? Why can they not be shared between Howells are and another health board to ensure that we can move those consultants around an area to provide services here in Pembrokeshire, Carmarthenshire, Ceredigion, etc., but they get the numbers under their belt, if you like, in the Swansea or Bridgend area. So help me out with understanding why it is that we can't be a little more creative with how we employ consultants here in Wales. Um, and I suppose finance as well has to be touched upon. With how uh, in deficit to the tune of in excess of 70 million pounds in the last 12 months, if we go on like that for 15 years, you'll have your billion pounds to build a new hospital. So surely the sooner it's built, the better. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Um, I suppose one, one comment just on uh, the emer emergency and planned transport, which we haven't touched on. Um, I, I think, um, depending on what's wrong with you, actually, you might need to miss all of our hospitals. So if there was an explosion in Milford and you have burns, um, then you need to go to Swansea, actually. You need to go to the burns and plastics units. The last thing you want to do is go to our hospitals. You need to go. The same would go if you fell off a cliff, actually, you, and you had major head or, or chest injuries. You need to go to Cardiff or back injuries. You don't need to go to our hospitals because it's time to definitive care rather than uh, doing a bit of a job locally. And, and that's why Rob's, I completely support Rob. It's the care you have immediately on the scene and then getting you to... Um, to, to the main to the place where you, you've got the, the collection of specialists um, then there'll be other situations where actually a land ambulance will be right so it's a, it's a bit of a judgment but we do need to support everybody on this a move from uh, 12 hour emergency medical retrieval with helicopter service to 24 hour service I've been um, public about this when the um, when the major trauma center was announced that it was going to Cardiff I, I feel very strongly about that I think it's also important for Paris and Betsy Cord Oliver. Um, the, the point about um, the uh, join up with, um, oh no, the point about planned care. Uh, so, so for, for non-emergency transport, um, of course, that brings into the discussion the uh, bus routes, the trains potentially, and the roads. And all of that isn't just a health issue course it has major impacts on our, our economy in this area uh, the wider determinants of health include um, employment so also as well as education and all those other things so actually we only healthcare only um, affects 10% of people's health and well-being so we're very conscious of the, the point that you make um, and I, I suppose we, we need to seriously consider if it's going to take a while to build the the fact that uh, the bus routes will be important the road network I know there's there's talk of potential um, dueling of part of the road network also potentially the trains become important because between Narbeth and St Clair's there is a, there is a train line and maybe the codependency of that's important because we do have communities that have relatively low car ownership so all of those things need to be part of this consideration in, t in terms of your um, point about uh, join up with ABMU, I mean, we, 
we meet now with the ABMU executive team, that's chief exec, chair, medical directors, and um, directors of planning, directors of operations, on a very regular basis now to consider services across our whole region. Um, so the planning that we've um, put into place with this has also been in conjunction with ABMU uh, Health Board, with their medical director and director of planning. In fact, some of our modeling has had to include them because if you move surgical services further west, then some patients will inevitably move into ABMU. So whether we're in name one whole health economy or not, actually to some extent doesn't matter. It's how we, how we work together. In terms of doctors working across our, our system, specialists working across our system, already for a whole range of specialties, they already work across our system. So renal, neurology, oncology, uh, cardiac, a whole range of specialties where they're already working between both sites, doesn't really matter who's employing them. Um, the challenge always is, it's the same though, that to get people to, once they're based in a certain area, to then travel out, to apply for a job where they've got to travel out for two hours. I mean, I love living here, um, you know, so I can't understand why they wouldn't want to live down here. But you know, th we've, we need to pr still provide a really good offer for them, for the future doctors to want to come and apply for jobs where they're working and providing care for our local uh, population. Thank you. Thank you. Just for information, I still have 12 members who want to ask questions. So I'll go next, please, to Councillor Tony Barron. Thank you. If I may, I'd first like to <coughs> excuse me, uh, pay tribute to and give my gratitude to the doctors, nurses, and support staff at Withybush who treated me yesterday with great professionalism and significantly a lot of kindness. And uh, for that, I am very grateful. I listened very carefully to your presentation, and many of the questions that came to my mind have already been asked. But listening to you, you talked about an improvement that would result from separating beds which were dedicated to urgent care and beds that were for planned operations. That would imply that you will increase the number of available beds, though, again, there is no financial uh, numbers given that would give us any confidence that that would actually happen, especially as the history has been one of bed reduction, not of bed increase. Uh, secondly, listening very carefully to you, uh, you made great stress that people would want to come and work in a new hospital and would want to be where the best services or the best facilities are, which is obviously very uh, clear. Uh, it is less obvious that people would be attracted to come to a hospital that is being changed and downgraded in one sense. And I noticed that you could not give a guarantee that no services would be uh, stopped at Withybush uh, because quite clearly uh, it's not going to be as an attractive place to be go to for a, a, a young doctor starting a career. And finally, if I may ask again on the recruitment side, is it likely that people would want to move twice, uh, once to an existing hospital and then move on to another hospital when that would mean them changing accommodation and maybe if they've got children changing school. Thank you. So thank you and look, I'm, I'm glad you had a good experience uh, yesterday and I'll pass on your uh, good wishes to, to the staff. Um, I, in terms of planned and emergency care, I suppose, and number of beds, things I would say is first of all that we've got 40% of people at least in our hospital at the moment who wouldn't need to be there if we had a different um, community and primary care system and quite a lot of those wouldn't need to even be in a hospital. 
um, if we had this right and we got our scheduled care right. So I suppose that has to factor in to our mathematical modeling. The other part of the mathematical modeling is that at the moment we've got plan care beds that are underutilized for plan care. So the amount of beds mathematically that you need for plan care would be less than we've got at the moment because half the time they're not being used for plan care. So I suppose all of those things need to be factored in as we go through the detailed business case modeling. And that's, that's why I suppose um, we haven't got all of, the, all of the precise detail on that. It also needs to factor, of course, the fact that everybody's getting older and we've got the 60% 60, um, 60 more 65-year-olds in the next 20 years. So who will have to bring with that frailty, chronic conditions, end of life, dementia, all of those things. So I suppose it, it, whether there's more beds or less beds, it's, it, in the end, we, we do need to move to a much more, um, a much higher value healthcare system where we haven't got so much waste and people don't end up in hospital unnecessarily because otherwise we will have a perpetual deficit going on for years and, and that won't, clearly won't be acceptable because that's money that we can't spend on primary and community care or, or social care, for example. So in terms of new roles, I would say that it's not just the, the doctors we're, we're trying to attract to the, to the acute hospital. This is about a, a whole multi-agency workforce. Um, so there will be new roles for nurses and therapists and, other, and physicians associates, associates and others and paramedics, you've heard, to take on leadership roles, leading care where the doctor isn't, isn't really um, needed there on a daily basis. So I think there will be some fantastic opportunities for those people. And we need to make sure that when we're describing our healthcare system, that it's attractive for those people in school at the moment. So they pick their careers and they can see that that career will be there secure when they come out of school in, in the future. That's going to be a really key part of this. And in terms of uh, guarantees, I don't think anybody, any uh, medical director across the whole of the UK could absolutely guarantee their services for the next 10 years. Of course, our plan is to keep those services go and recruit to them so that we have enough staff for the main hospital. In terms of moving twice, I think, you know, the, the people will make choices. If they come and move to, to live here, they'll make choices about where they live when they see that we have a new model that we're all um, committed to. So I, I, you know, I, I don't think they would have to move twice. Um, no, it, it won't be a surprise to them, uh, the, the location of the new hospital. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Dyker, minutes, please. Thank you, Chair. In fact, most of the, uh, my question has been covered in your response to um, Councillor Adams, but it was regarding sort of transport links and, and enhancing those and improving those, not just for um, people who are attending hospital, but for those who perhaps don't have the ability to drive a car or even you know, fill up a car. Um, so I just wondered if you had, have you had any discussions with Welsh Government about improving um, transport links, or is that something to be had in the future? Thank you. It, it's, and I, I need to pass on to, well, maybe Sarah wants to answer, maybe. <laughs> Good, before I... I'm Sarah, Sarah Jennings. Um, I think that's where we can have a really interesting conversation with yourselves as a county council, because the bus services, the transport to get to all sorts of facilities, as well as maybe reopening conversations with Welsh Government and the Trunk Road Agency on the larger infrastructure with the rail network on the rail links. I think there'll be more power in doing that as two or three local authorities and the health board together. And I think there's probably a conversation following this workshop as to how we do that and what we think and through the Swansea Bay City deal and other partnerships. I think there's some, some interesting new conversations we could open that would not just benefit the people needing to get to a hospital for health purposes, but the economic development of the entire region by opening up West Wales. Because this, I mean, a hospital on this scale, new build, new staff, that's an economic development pr proposal that's significant um, and we haven't seen anything like that for a while. So I think that's where our really positive partnership working relationships can be harnessed. So I think maybe uh, you've raised something that we should capitalise on in over the next um, few weeks and months. We haven't had a conversation with them yet because I think it's better to have it together than separately and I think we need to know what we all think would be the best benefit for Pembrokeshire and Carmarthenshire residents. Thank you. Um, Councillor Mike Williams, please. Thank 
me tell you, sir, um, perhaps I should warn Dr. Clover I'm from Tenby, so you have some idea of what's coming. Um, I, I wouldn't be forgiven um, uh, if I didn't raise the situation of primary care in Tenby, and you take over responsibility for that from August the 1st. Um, the last three years, we've witnessed very elderly people queuing for appointments from 7.45 in the morning to half past eight, and being 10th or 11th in the queue, and when they get to the counter, they're told there are no appointments left. So what do they do? They jump in a car if they have one and go to Withy Bush, which compounds the problem in Withy Bush. I find it quite amazing in the 21st century that this is the kind of primary care service that you offer in Pembrokeshire. I spent quite a lot of time in northeastern Romania, and I can see a GP by just ringing a bell and walking in, in one of the poorest countries in the European <coughs> Union. That's a heck of an indictment on us, isn't it? I will respond to the main document through another uh, route, but I've got three questions I'd like to ask you specifically about, about primary care in Tenby. Um, you, you take over, as I said, from August the 1st. Um, will the Health Board continue the daily running as per the General Medical Services contract regarding opening hours? Will the Health Board continue the walk-in service based at Tenby Cottage Hospital and if so, will the Health Board increase the hours of operation to include weekends and bank holidays? And the third question, what is the future of the 10 NHS beds based in Tenby Cottage Hospital? I'm here to believe there might be a plan to redesignate the 10 beds as local authority beds. And I would just ask you to bear in mind that from next weekend, the population in the immediate vicinity of Tenby will be around 60,000, and we have no permanent GPs based in Tenby. So unfortunately, I'm afraid, you have a flood of people seeking medical uh, uh, care going to Withy Bush. So, uh, look, and I'm s sorry for the experience of the people in Tenby, that that's their experience. Clearly, that's not the kind of um, primary community care system that we're aspiring to. So it doesn't fit with, them, with what, I, what I've described. And one of the challenges is that if, if, um, if the system of the future is one where people can't get easy access to community and primary care, whether it be GP or, or the rest of the community services around, wrapped around them, um, and that they end up defaulting to A and E or a minor injuries unit, then that's 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 a problem, and that's certainly not what we we would be aspiring to. So, apologies to people who have that that experience. Um, it's not; it wouldn't be our plan to um, continue to, to manage. We're looking at all sorts of options in in the future for Tembe. Um, you know, I think there would be a range of options. It's a lovely it's a lovely area. Um, and uh, you know, it's been. A, I realise it's been a, a challenge, primary care services in Tenby for quite, quite a long time now. In terms of your three specific questions, the daily running, opening hours. My understanding is yes, that's that's what our plan is. In terms of um, the walk-in service, I know the plan is to continue as we were, but I would need to check on the extended opening hours. I'd have to come back back to you on that because I haven't got my primary co care colleagues uh, around me. Unless no. Nope. And, in, and the same with the 10, the ten beds. So I, I'd have to come back to you, Councillor Williams, because I wasn't obviously, um, didn't have the detail of that, that brief, but it would be easy for us to find, and I'm happy to share that with you openly um, after the event. Yeah. Fine. Thank you for that. Okay, uh, Councillor Bob Kilminster, please. Um, my role within this council is finance, so uh, it's no surprise in uh, some of the questions I'm going to ask you. Um, I'm very concerned by the lack of financial data. Um, estimates must have been made, and therefore I would ask you how much will new community facilities cost? How much will a new hospital cost? Um, are you then going to make up the backlog of repairs? and are you going to include that within your community hospital budget? What effect is this going to have then on your revenue budget? So will you have to pay the borrowing costs? Because 
I can imagine that whilst government may well decide that they will uh, possibly supply you with the money, but they will probably ask you to pay it back if I know them. Um, and can you actually afford any of these options based on the current performance, which is already the worst in Wales for an NHS um, section? So those questions in financial terms. And I, I, over many years, have not understood why you can get agency and locum staff to work for you, but you can't get permanent staff. I have to ask yourself, have you actually asked the question of yourselves, are we actually doing our job correctly in keeping, retaining and paying the staff in the proper way, or are you simply blaming all your troubles on your non-recruitment? So if I, if I can start with the last, the last question first, the last point first. I mean, I think I've said a number of times why um, people might not be attracted to come and work um, on a, a very frequent rotor or in a situation where the facilities aren't, aren't as up to date um, or you've got a lot of locum and temporary staff. I mean, I suppose it's the same when you look at um, healthcare um, organisations in coastal communities across the whole of the UK and indeed if you look in other westernised societies they, they find challenges recruiting staff because whilst we like to come on holiday and, and we all like to live here but the majority of people like to come on holiday trying to get um, a, work for, a, a sustainable workforce is, is generally quite a challenge in, in coastal areas um, but you know I, I'm sure there's there's certainly things over the last three years where we've got better at recruiting compared to um, where we were, say, five, ten years ago. So there are some departments in Withybush where actually we've had some real success. When I started as medical director, we had no permanent A&E consultants at Withybush. We now have two, which we're celebrating. You know, and one of them is from a, a teaching hospital in um, London, and they saw our advert on the tube. So, you know, we've been quite innovative. We're also having to spend some money to do that on recruitment. But um, I, and also we've had some um, successes in getting people from overseas to come and work with us because of the kind of training program that we're producing. We may see more fruits of that in the future because hopefully they'll tell their friends overseas to come and work with us. So, you know, I suppose, look, it's, um, we can always learn, but, it, but I think in the end, trying to basically recruit people to... Um, circumstances where they can get a better deal elsewhere is really is, re is really difficult. And in terms of why do we get agency staff? Agency staff cost more and demand more money. And there's a, there's a you know there's a UK contract and it's considerably more money. And that's why we spend millions on locum agency pay. And that's why our deficit is is quite high. And partly it's because I'm sitting here trying to um, maintain the services during this transition period with large amounts of local and agency pay and you're asking, you know, you're asking me to guarantee that um, and that, that costs money so it's a bit of a cyclical sort of uh, discussion that, an argument isn't it really um, but in terms of the financial data, um, look there's, you're quite right to say that the, the data that we have around the finances isn't as detailed as you want for a full business case um, and I suppose at this stage we have done financial modelling with, with uh, colleagues and it does suggest that, that the models that we would run would be uh, cheaper than our current co cost model. In the end, the more we um, invest in uh, uh, the hospitals, we will be able to spend less in community and primary care, obviously. Um, there's an issue with, um, I suppose, when you look across the world at community and primary care systems, that it's difficult to find one that's absolutely perfectly bespoke for our system. So it's difficult to absolutely prescribe exactly what, how much money it will cost for our, our multi-agency community network, particularly with the fact that there's a huge amount of duplication, as I've said, between health and social care. So there'll be a lot of mathematical factors to consider when to, to give the answer to your question, which I, I, can't, I can't give. And some of that will be developed in the working we have with um, uh, our local authority colleagues, WASP, other agencies for that multi-agency model, but that will be need to be worked out quite quickly. I would accept that. In terms of the hospital model, um, 
you know, I, I, we haven't got an absolute figure on the size of the hospital because whatever, everything I said earlier about the amount of beds depends on how um, efficient we can be in terms of getting people back to the community hospital and only having a sort of two or three day length of stay in general in the main hospital. So the figures we've come up with have, um, you know, there's a range, but we haven't got the precise figures. And I, I think we should go through the detailed business case modeling before we sort of start plucking figures out of the air. Surely you have to have some understanding of, of how much something is going to cost you and when there's a cost benefit before you ask people to make a consultation about what they want because we don't even know whether it's affordable. So, so look, in, in terms of building a new hospital, it, they generally cost in experience about a million pounds a bed. And so if we just if we provided all the beds, it would cost as, as many as the beds we have. But the thing is, the, the challenge would be, which is a, a significant number of hundreds of millions, but the, the challenge will be is that there will be uh, potentially less cost if, it, if they were reprovided in a community environment. And we do have some good facilities uh, in Withybush, and we have some good facilities in Glangwilly. Um, so we'd want to maintain as much of those as possible, but it's at the scale of orders of hundreds of millions to build a new hospital. Thank you. I'm conscious that um, time is marching on, and I still have seven members on my list who wish to ask a question. So, Councillor Josh Bainham, please. I'll, I'll be quick. Um, I just want to go back onto the uh, recruitment. You said earlier that you would be recruiting harder than you have before. I just wanted some more clarification on what that would, what you would do differently to what you're doing now. And I also wanted to ask about, obviously, the United Kingdom is supposed to be leaving the European Union next year. And have you done any modelling on effects on recruiting from outside the country? Um, another question was, um, at the moment, there are actually no planned events in Pembroke Dock or the Pembroke area. I know Tessa, to your right, did flag this up after our last council meeting. And I think the answer was that there was some work done before during the earlier part of this consultation. But I think with something so dramatic, um, drastic as this, then I think it would be good to have something in those large population areas. Um, another question would be about the NHS sort of going digital. So we're sitting in here at the moment, we've got webcasting facilities, but we've also got my account where you can report stuff online. And the other week I went to uh, get a physio appointment and I found the form online, but I couldn't find an email address to send it to. So I had to actually put that in the post and send it along. And I was just wondering how a sort of new planned hospital would be more modern, but also what you would be doing in the meantime. Um, I know uh, Councillor Bateman over there did mention the uh, new hospital and obviously the health board owning no land between Narbuth and St. Clair's. But I was wondering, have you actually identified a couple of sites along that sort of strip and where you possibly would go? And my final question was regarding the uh, population in Pembrokeshire in the summer and have you modeled the sort of demand on the service then and how you would plan to deal with that? That's, I've got six questions, but I'll, tr <laughs> I'll try and uh, so. Uh, re recruiting harder. Um, I think it isn't just about trying harder. I think when, when you have an, a, a model that you're trying to recruit to, then we would um, make sure that's a key part of our recruitment campaign so that people, uh, people have certainty about the kind of model that they'll be coming to work in, that they know that they'll be part of it, a, a period where they'll be developing towards that new model and part of it, they will be working within it. So we'll be trying to recruit a certain type of individual, whether it be nurse, therapist, doctor, carer, physician's associates. We'll be looking at um, more advanced care paramedics, all of those things. So, so it's more about that than, than just trying harder. Um, I think in terms of Brexit, look, I don't think we've done any specific modeling around Brexit, but, it, but you know, there are concerns about our European staff members that we want to keep and whether we had to get people across. We have issues at the moment with tier two visas, um, which is a real um, challenge for us, getting people across from overseas quickly. It's hampering our efforts to recruit to junior doctor posts in every single one of our hospitals at the moment. So I would say that that, that is problematic and that then every time no, someone doesn't turn up, that's another post where we're trying to get a locum. It's increased spend, which we can't spend on something else. But you know, it is something we're gonna have to seriously uh, look at the impacts of Brexit. In terms of Pembroke Dock, I know we'll take that feedback back in the team. 
and we'll have a think about what we can do about because we do want to get out to every every community and hear what everyone's what people have got to say the events have been you've heard a bit about the success of some of the events i found them uh, really successful because we've been able to have one-to-one -one or perhaps one-to-four conversations where we get into the real detail of the, the issues that really matter to people in those local communities which are different in different places you you go to in terms of NHS going digital we've had some big advances recently which you wouldn't say were big advances maybe which should surprise you but you know we're able to access GP records now um, that's, you know, that that's, should have happened many, many years ago, but we can do that now, or most of our doctors can. You know, but, but, you know, there's a major gulf between where we need to be and where we are now in terms of digital. We're, tr we're trying to um, push the progress on that, but with our current systems and the way they are at the moment, that's difficult. So your experience of the physio appointment, um, unfortunately, it doesn't surprise me because we, we could give lots of other examples of that. We've just appointed a new chief clinical information officer who's a clinician who's trying to help drive and champion that now. So, because the future um, workforce and the future population are not going to be happy fiddling about with bits of paper, they're going to interact with us digitally. And that would be our plan, has to be our plan for the new, new hospital and all the new facilities. But we've got to be mindful it's got to all be costed, uh, remembering what Bob Kilmans has said. Um, the land, we don't own any sites. We haven't looked at any sites. Um, what we do know is that I've given the, the, um, the points about what's pulling the hospital westwards because of the rural populations of Pembrokeshire. It can't go too far east. But then if it goes, and if it goes too far west, then we've got the challenges of sustainable services and north um, Carmarthenshire. And also there's the codependency potentially with the train line that becomes important. So all of those factors we're considering, but that hasn't met that we, meant that we've started looking at sites. Um, and the last question was about, oh, summer numbers. We have, we have looked at summer numbers, um, and actually the vast majority of people with, who come, into, um, come to us in the summer need uh, minor injuries, minor illnesses, treatment, so they would be able to be dealt with in our minor injuries unit at Withybush Hospital, Tenby, but on the other hand, there will be some who fall off a cliff and have to go to Cardiff. So there's a range of things we have, we have started to model that. Again, that have to be part of the detailed modeling of the new system. Thank you. Thank you. Um, members, I've no wish to stifle debate, but the second part of this afternoon is a workshop which is going to take place in committee room one or two. Um, I still have seven people who've indicated that they'd like to ask a question. Can I ask if any of those seven um, are willing to forego their question in order to move forward, or are you keen to have your, your question answered in the chamber? I'm quite happy either way, but I am conscious that um, you know, it's coming up for quarter to four. So I still have them, Paul Harris, Alison, um, Tom Tudor, Mike John, Paul Miller, Tim Evans, and Jacob William, who've requested to ask a, ask a question. Okay, then Councillor Harris, please. Thank you, Tessa. Um, I, I come from a, a, rural, um, a coastal area and I'm very concerned about the population explosion that we get in the summer and the aging population that we have in Newport. Mm -hmm. uh, difficult to get, even to Gangwilly now, it's, it's, it's causing a big problem with us. There's grass growing down the middle of the B roads that we've got to access Gangwilly from. Anyway, I can acknowledge what you will the clin clinicians are stay, saying. Uh, I think Steve Moore, the chief executive, said the status quo is not an option. Uh, I think you, you're quoted as saying, Phil, um, we need to change. That was your bottom line. And I think Libby uh, was saying that uh, more of the same is not enough. So the, the, this is what I'm hearing from you. Um, again, on the recruitment problem and the temporary staff, it's not good enough having the temporary staff. Why don't we pay them more? Why don't we have a rural waiting? Why don't we, we've got the same pot of money, just alter the, uh, the percentages on the same pot of money. Uh, that's my first question. Um, I think you also said, Libby, that uh, the transformation should be clinically led, um, keeping our community healthy with care closer to people's homes, keeping people away from main hospital services by care closer to people's homes. 
what are the details of this closer to homes care that you're advocating? Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, in terms of um, the uh, rural waiting you mentioned, I think that's an important factor because when you look at our GP trainees that we've managed to recruit because we've, um, they've had an extra amount of money that uh, means that they only have that money if they stay with us for a certain period of time. Um, we, that was quite successful in Ceredigion and Pembrokeshire, but of course it meant that then Carmarthenshire, I realise you won't worry about this, but in Carmarthenshire the scheme then didn't have, we, we didn't have many um, trainees. And I suppose the further, the, the question, it's a, it's, a, um, it's a Welsh government um, thing, this, because terms and conditions are set nationally. Um, we, um, you know, you can see that we have pushed to some extent for a rural waiting because we've had that with the GPs. I don't think it's the answer to everything. I don't think it will solve everything because the agency staff, the amount that um, they uh, can achieve, the sort of salaries they can achieve, are, are really very high, and it's a UK-wide um, challenge. So they, they if, if we didn't pay it, they could go to England, Scotland, Northern Ireland. They could go anywhere, really, to get that, to get that sort of um, salary. And it's a lifestyle choice now for local and agency. Of course, for, for what we have to do is make our terms and conditions as attractive as possible. And I don't think it's just money. I think we have to offer them other, other things as well. And we have found that um, some, some of the things around um, the, that we can offer people um, around opportunities for career progression have been, quite, um, have been quite enticing for people. I do think if we had really good education and research facilities, people would be more likely to come. And I think if they were working with more permanent staff, they would, in, in a, a sort of a less frequent rotor, they're, more li they're going to be more likely to come. I think just giving them money is not going to solve it. In terms of the community models, what you said. Yeah, in, in, terms of the, in terms of the community model. Yeah, yeah, in terms of the community model. Look, the community model um, that I was trying to describe earlier was this multi-agency community network. There's two, two parts to that. So, so I'm talking about health, social care, and other agencies and third sector working together in each locality. So in Pembrokeshire, that would be north, Pembrokeshire and, and South Pembrokeshire. That, that community network, th there'd be two big tasks, I suppose. One of them would be this, um, we, would, we would risk stratify the whole of our population using the GP list, social care information, and we'd identify the, the different needs of the population. So at the top of our pyramid, if you can imagine it, there would be people with end of life issues. We know who those are, but we would be putting in um, uh, planned care for those individuals so they shouldn't have to end up in crisis coming to hospital. I know we're already doing some of that work now. Then beneath that are the people with frailty, chronic conditions, end of life and dementia, a slightly bigger group, who again, we have some preemptive um, and uh, early intervention work with, with, those, with that group of people, but we don't have um, it in a systematic way, so that needs to be scaled up. And then there'll be the people who are at risk of moving into that group who are the sort of people who would want to interact with us digitally about their help, health, and we need to try and manage their risk factors for moving into that group who've got chronic conditions and the like. They would also be, um, they'd all, that workforce would be located around the community hubs where they would either be going out to visit people in their homes or people would be able to access those community hubs for a range of um, uh, assessments, advice, support, and, and treatments. And it also, I, meant, I should have mentioned mental health would, of course, be, be a key part of that. So, you know, but we've got to build that. The detail of that will depend on how well we integrate with health and social care and how much our partners will work with us. You know, it's going to have to be a team effort, that. But that's, those are the needs of the future population. And we need to provide most of that locally because you work, most of the things that matter to people aren't the sort of things you need to go to hospital. Alison Tudor. Um, I picked up on um, that we're, there's going to be a local general hospital in Finathley, and my concern is that 
um, so Nathalie's got quite a densely populated area and I'm concerned about if we have to transfer patients over to ABMU, concerned about the quality of care obviously that they're going to get, but have ABMU got the capacity um, to treat these patients and also under financial agreements with Howell Bar, do you think it's going to be a drain on Howell Bar? Um, and then totally different. My other question is around um, the amount of births that we need to um, sustain a consultant-led maternity unit. Um, I'm just wondering how many births are Glanguilly supporting at the moment and how far east this hospital is going to have to go so that Pembrokeshire people will get our maternity unit special care and a paediatric unit. Thank you. So in terms of the, um, the Clenethley situation, we're, we're modelling that with ABMU and any business case development, if, if it was proposal A where um, Clenethley is a, a community hospital, um, there would be a significant flow to ABMU, much bigger than the other proposals, and any business case would have to be um, arranged with them and put forward with them. So there is a concern, quite rightly, whether we would get that for the same um, the same cost as we're doing it now, because we're because that model in Clenethley is, um, you know, it, it's been reconstructed. The Royal College of Physicians President has been there to say it's a, it's a model for the future. They don't have the range of services that, that are in Withybush at the moment or Glanguilly. So it's a relatively restricted um, sort of service model. But um, what we wouldn't want to do is move to a situation where it actually costs more. And that means we've got less money to spend on all the other services that we need. So it's exactly your point that I, I would agree with you. I do have some concerns. In terms of the births, we have about, in total this area, we have about 3,500 if you include Bronglice, um, which, you, which you can because um, Bronglice uh, high-risk deliveries come to the main unit um, in Glanguilly at the moment. So that means that for 3,500, we certainly have enough complex um, cases. If we move it too far west, it, the, the concern would be is if it gets anywhere near or below 2,500 births. And I think at that point, the deanery would have concerns about sending us trainees and then the consultants of the futures. In the future, we wouldn't attract the best consultants because they would be less likely to want to work in a, in a unit without trainees. And if you don't have obstetrics, of course, you, don't, you can't have neonatology, which then affects your risk of pediatrics. And you also need a certain amount of pediatric presentations as well to main acute, maintain acute pediatrics. So I suppose our concern would be that how far west you can, can move it, but also um, also worrying, of course, that we, we must move it far enough west so that the population of rural Pembrokeshire have, have access to it. So, you know, we, we don't have an absolute location on that, but it's something we're working on at the moment, the modelling between those, between Narbeth and St. Clair's. Okay, Councillor Tom Tudor. Yes, thank you very much. Um, a lot of my questions have already been answered um, in terms of recruitment. Um, one of the issues of concern I have is that um, of the infrastructure. Um, as you know, I've got a notice of motion going forward calling for Pembroke County Council to lobby the Welsh Assembly Government on, on dueling the A40 from Hathrex to St. Clair's. Um, I would hope that as an authority, you engage with the Welsh Assembly in terms of pushing forward for such a thing. Um, currently, if you go into the Welsh Assembly website, you will see that the proposals for the Llandewi Velfi Bypass are there, dating 2006, um, and they have yet to be completed. So there, there needs to be a lot more work in terms of the infrastructure. Um, the other issue of concern I have, and that is with regard to some of the concerns uh, Rob Jeffries raised um, and the golden hour. Um, yes, we need uh, paramedics will be on site and uh, um, will be delivering services um, to the patients immediately. However, we need to improve and increase the amount of paramedics we have in Pembrokeshire and ambulances to, to provide, the, to, to provide, provide this um, sustainable model. And what work is being done in terms of that? Because that's something that's uh, an essential part of the jigsaw. Because um, also, on, on, on positive note, um, in terms of the new build you were talking about in Whitland, um, you're saying that it's going to have the cath lab um, brought to this hospital, which will bring closer to the people of Pembrokeshire. 
well over the years I've actually travelled in an ambulance with Rob transferring these patients up to Morrison Hospital and uh, certainly not a journey I want to uh, um, do on, on too often uh, occasion and there's no, nothing to do with your driving Rob <laughs> um, but <laughs> if, there's, if you could um, give me some feedback on my infrastructure investment and so I'll probably let Rob answer the paramedics question, but um, in terms of the infrastructure, I mean, as Sarah said, we, we, we need to engage on that um, and uh, with, with Welsh Government, and it's best to engage together. We'd, of course, be supportive. Anything, any improvements in infrastructure will support um, health services and, of course, support the wider economy. So um, we'd want to be a, a strong voice in that. I'll just hand over to Rob. Thanks very much. Uh, well, you never did travel well, Tom. Um, I, I guess the, the issue now is that uh, under the new arrangements, uh, ambulance services are commissioned by individual health boards. Um, certainly when uh, women and children services moved from uh, Woodybush uh, to Glangwilly, uh, I made the case, um, or my execs made the case to how they are that we simply um, would not be able to guarantee um, a, a safe service. Uh, after some discussion, but before the, the uh, services were moved, uh, the health board uh, commissioned a further 10 paramedics and a, and a clinical team leader. Um, this Saturday, just gone now, uh, we just um, uh, interviewed uh, 85 uh, paramedics, uh, obviously for the, for the whole of Wales. Uh, discussions I had uh, this morning uh, with the chief operating officer um, is a recognition uh, that we will need to commission uh, additional staff. Uh, our practitioners already work within the primary care support team. Uh, we've got our practitioners working, as it happens, uh, as, as Councillor Williams will know, uh, in, in Tembe. Um, and we also then uh, rotate our practitioners around some of the other directly managed uh, practices. Um, but we're, you know, we've made it quite clear, um, and I've seen no resistance from the health board, that once uh, we arrive at a, a model uh, that goes forward, uh, that modelling will then have to be done to see what we, what requirements from a, a workforce planning uh, uh, perspective is required uh, and I guess we're in a unique situation um, certainly on Saturday we were interviewing uh, uh, newly qualified paramedics from Plymouth from the West Midlands um, because they were being attracted by the developments within uh, the ambulance service in Wales um, so I'm, I'm confident that um, you know our, our workforce will expand will expand considerably by the time we get to a, an agreed option Thank you, Councillor Mike John. Thank you, uh, Tess, and thank, thanks for the presentation. I sat through it up the, uh, up the archives a couple of weeks ago for the Town and Community Councils, and it's interesting. A lot of the points are similar being brought up, which I'm sure hits home the, the, the worries people have. Um, I just want to go back to one point which hasn't really been touched on today, but you mentioned the, uh, the minor injuries unit plan for, for Withy Bush, should the new hospital go ahead, etc. Um, and all the services that could provide, which are most, mostly what accident and emergency would do anyway. But uh, again, it hasn't been said now, and it wasn't said then, whether it's going to be 24 hours, seven day week, or just 12 hours, because when you consider all the sporting and leisure activities throughout the county, around the coast, sports fields over the, over the summer and winter, it leaves a, a huge area exposed if there's no cover on the weekend. So has any more thought been given to that, or was it something which is being developed through the consultation? The plan is 24-7, uh, seven, seven days a week. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor. Sorry, that, that's changed from what I asked last time, and I'm that's very welcome, so thank you. Thank you, Thank you Councillor Paul Miller. Thank you, Chair. Um, can I start by thanking Dr. Thrill and his team for attending today. Um, being as polite as I can, I didn't always have a huge amount of confidence in the senior leadership team at Gulvar, and credit where credit's due, I do now have that confidence, and I'm really pleased to see some of the faces that we've got in leadership positions in the health board. And I think we should be very grateful for that. That hasn't always been the case in my view, so, so thank you to the team for their efforts. Um, the case for change, I think, that you're articulating is on the face of it, compelling. And I accept, again, as I didn't, didn't always, that despite your best efforts, it is becoming near impossible for you to recruit to all the positions that you need to recruit to in order to provide us with a, a service that we'd all aspire to. I, you know, 
I, I'm willing at least to listen to the proposals that you're setting out and I'll carefully frame my response to your consultation. But in principle, do I think that there are benefits to be had from a new build hospital um, offering both urgent and planned care in the region that you're talking about? Yes, I think I do. Um, but I do, of course, have some concerns. And let me start first with um, one of those, and that's around access to emergency care. So it's difficult for everyone, and me included, I think, to contemplate that radical change might be what's required. I mean, every time I've ever visited Withy Bush, I've had what I thought was excellent care. The staff there have treated me superbly, and, and that's been true of all of my immediate family and all my experience. But do I actually know what good looks like? And it, it's when you say things to me like, you've only got two A&E consultants for Withybush, you've only got four split between Withybush and Glanguilly, that I start to think, actually, would I know if that was good emergency care? And is it? Are we providing the level of care that we'd actually aspire to provide to people in Pembrokeshire? So my first question is around that access in an emergency. Can you be clear with us that outcomes in emergencies for the majority of people living in Pembrokeshire will be better under your new model than they are currently. My second question is about strengthening of community services. Very recent experience for me in my hometown of Nayland, where you know, the Health Board have recently um, agreed to close a primary care surgery in the town. How deliverable is it to actually have these community services in the place that we want them to have? Because I get it, for most ailments, you don't need to go to A&E, you don't need to be sitting in a hospital bed. In fact, actually, I understand that that's bad for you. But how can we have the confidence that we're able to build that community network when, right now at least, we can't recruit those general practitioner doctors? We're closing a busy, very important surgery in, in Nayland as just one example. Michael Williams articulated the problems in Tenby. How can we have the confidence that we're able to build that community network such that the new hospital won't be equally reliant on, or sorry, we won't be equally reliant on that new hospital for those minor needs? And then I guess the third question is about transition arrangements, and I think Sam Kurt said it already. How clear can you be with us that your intention isn't to make any of these transitional changes in the interim, that until this new urgent care centre is available, there'll be a 24-7-365 A&E at Withybush providing the best standard of care that you can provide to the Pembrokeshire people. So those are my three questions. But thank you again for your attendance today. So thank, thank you very much for your, for your kind words. Um, I, um, in terms of the access to emergency care, I mean, the, the inter and your important question about outcomes, um, what we do know is that outcomes uh, that, are, that come from having a large proportion of um, locum and agency staff are poorer. We know that quality of care is generally poorer. The reason that each and every one of us has a, generally has a relatively good experience in our hospitals, although it's not always the case, is that um, is the really hard work of our staff. We have some of the most committed, dedicated staff on the front line that you could ever ask for because they're so committed to living in this area um, and to maintain the hospital services. So I think that's why you do get that experience, but we're getting to a stage, I think, where it's too thin in many, in many specialties and on many wards. Um, so we're struggling to provide that kind of level of outcome and experience. Um, so I think just by virtue of having more permanent staff working on rotors where they're less frequent, um, we'll, we'll bring in higher quality, um, high quality staff as well, and better facilities. I, I think we're all convinced that outcomes will be better. That's what, I, that, that's what all my colleagues are convinced of. In, in terms of uh, strengthening community services and how deliverable it will it be, I suppose one of the, one of the difficulties is that the, the kind of um, the, the lifeblood of the community services is the same as the lifeblood of our hospitals. So the trainees that we have in our area, um, training nurses, therapists, doctors, paramedics, pharmacists, this delicacy here, all, all of our, um, all of our uh, whole team tr tend to train in our, um, want to come and train in a great environment. And when we haven't got great training facilities, we don't tr track that multi-professional uh, workforce, so we believe that we'll start to track those. But it's it's a long game. This is going to take some time to transform um, our, 
giving you team primary care services. We think we've got the best chance if we have the best facilities for those trainees to come and uh, work in for the future. And in, in terms of the transitional changes, how, how confident can we be? Um, I do, I do think that when, we, when we're able to be clear on what our service model is, when, when we get rid of the cloud over uh, you know, what sort of services are there going to be and how they are for our population, I think people will come. We'll have something we can, we can recruit to. If we don't do this, then I think there will be a continuous cloud and it will be really difficult to recruit people. I think not only that, but it will be really difficult to retain staff. So I think, you know, I think there's a really positive message from this, from this model where people want to come and be, be with us on this journey because it's not just for this generation, it's for the next generation to come. Um, Councillor Tim Evans. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think most of my questions have been answered, but one of the things, uh, I've had a, I live in Harford West and I've had a lot of um, uh, people that work in the emergency services come up to me and talk to me about their concern about A&E leave in Harford West. And I think in the area, I think the A&E leave in Harford West is the big bugbear in the whole equation, especially with the uh, coastal places like St David's, Dale, and then we've got things like um, LNG, all this sort of thing. People's concerns about A&E, I think, is the big problem. And moving east, and I think where you've shot yourself in the foot a bit, is that with your proposals, um, you're talking about, we, we talk about Sinclair's and Whitland and Arbor, and you're talking of um, an 18 minute journey between the two sites. It's a 12 mile journey. I think if you'd come to people and said, it's going to be an Arbor, it's going to be, then maybe people would have understood it better. Um, and I think when it ends up, it is gonna go further east than we, than we think it is. Um, but I think the main concern is the A&E department. I understand um, with the planned care hospital, um, a new planned care hospital, I do understand that, but I think, you know, looking at the A&E part, and I've, I've used the A&E myself in the last 12 months and had fantastic service, but if we could keep it in this part of Wales, that's what um, the feedback I get from people that I talk to. And understand the concern because you know when when change is proposed like this there's bound to be a, a level of concern ac across the population whether it be rural Pembrokeshire, Hapa West or um, Pimpside Farmers, Vandavri, wh wherever in this area um, every, everyone is, is affected by it and and you know change is difficult to, to accept I, I, I would recognize that. I think um, the issue with us proposing a specific location would be that, would, um, would be that we, we're not open to influence. At the, at the moment, we felt our feeling was that actually we needed to hear everyone's views. We didn't want to prejudge the consultation. And actually, if, if we'd have put it, if we'd have said it was in a place where you don't like, then we, you wouldn't have had the opportunity to say what you've just said. So it's it's, it is really important this, that actually there is that that um, zone and I, that we're able to explain the sort of things that worry us about where the hospital would be located between Narbeth and St. Clair's, which I've said involves train lines and, and um, sustainability of service as well as the rural coastal population of Pembrokeshire and the north of Carmarthenshire. There'll be other things as well that will be factored in, like availability of land, for example. But, you know, that, that's, why, that's why this is important to leave it open so that people have that opportunity to influence. Another question I had at the bottom, I wish I'd missed out. You talked about 24-hour uh, helicopter uh, responses in Pembrokeshire. How is that going to be funded? Is that going to be funded through Hilda, or is it because at the moment I believe it's charitable, the, the air ambulance? So which way is that going to be funded? So well, well, Sham. So the it's supported by the air ambulance at the moment. It's a 12-hour service that's. Um, the governance is through actually ABMU Health Board to, to Welsh Government. So, um, but it's, a, it's an all Wales service. So there will be certain regions of Wales that will be less dependent on emergency medical retrieval than our region. So there'll be some regions of Wales where there'll be councils that will have less interest than this council in emergency medical retrieval. So it will be central funding for emergency med for, to move it to a 12-hour service. I mean, there's a possibility we could try and fund it ourselves, 
but of course then that would be you'd have to add that to the cost of our our proposals and at the moment the, the funding for the 12-hour service is is Welsh Government so we need to make a compelling case I think for the for a 24-7 service that's equitable across Wales um, and I would say there'll be other regions like Paris and uh, North Wales that would want to join us on that thank you I have just two councillors now waiting to ask their questions so councillor Jacob Williams and then councillor Lucy Thank you, Tessa. I had one question, but before I came to you, I wanted to respond to a point Councillor Paul Miller raised. That was about the community element. In my view, uh, it's a cultural thing in the UK. I don't think people realise how well-trained pharmacists are, and I don't think they're used well enough. On the continent, on the continent I think pharmacists are used for instance, if you have a rash, you, you could go to a, a pharmacist and they could advise, whereas in the UK, it's a cultural thing. We go to the doctor for everything. Um, whereas I say on the continent, I think that's different. That might answer your Romanian point, Councillor Williams. Coming back to my question, which hasn't been answered or it's been touched upon today, this is about this new proposed hospital. Page 10 or slide 10 of your presentation today lists the following matters have been decided and are not open to influence in this consultation. One of them is the delivery of urgent care at a new urgent care hospital serving the south of the health board area. That's the one between Narbeth and St. Clair's. Clearly, that's not, you've decided on that and the fact that the health board has decided on that suggests strongly that the health board has a high degree of confidence that it can be funded so my question is, could the health board or the representatives here, I'm not sure which one, whether it's Dr. Clear, please explain how it's intended to be funded. And I don't, I don't want for the double glazing salesman answer that it's going to pay for itself in 10, 20 years. I, I, I'm asking how it's going to be funded if it is to be built. I've tried to avoid those sort of answers, but um, so... I mean, it'll be centrally fun in terms of capital. It's no different from any other capital program uh, that uh, any public sector organisation would, would enter into, except that it's very large. In the same way that um, that uh, similar projects have, have, have sort of been generated in other areas of Wales. So it would be the subject of the five-stage business case model, and we would be looking for funding from Welsh uh, government. We haven't decided on the the mechanism of that. We haven't had detailed discussions of that, um, but it would be, need to be Welsh Government funding. In terms of revenue, any revenue consequences, that needs to be um, factored into the overall model because we couldn't, um, we'd have to, uh, well, whilst the new model does um, mean that there are significant savings on the current model, we couldn't end up with a revenue tail from a capital build that meant that we ended up in a perpetual deficit for, for years to come as some health systems have seen um, around, around the UK. So, you know, it, it will be very much part of a very detailed business case proposal with the, with the capital money coming from, um, from Welsh Government. Does that answer the question? Thank you. Well, Welsh Government cannot um, cannot give us assurances, ca cannot announce that the uh, money for a capital bill until they've seen a detailed business case because they need to, it, um, they need to ensure that it represents good value um, spend for, for public money. So as I said earlier, there is a chicken and egg issue that we would need to go through the capital, uh, the business case development process before they could announce the money. On the other hand, we have enough confidence given looking at systems across the rest of the world and looking at the kind of models that work across the rest of the world and the, the, the needs of our population that this model would be affordable. Sounds like there's a, yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Okay, um, the last question, unless somebody puts their hand up, is to Councillor Rhys Sinnott. Thank you very much, Tessa, and thanks everyone from the team uh, in the health board for coming uh, to see us this afternoon. I've never seen Dallas so quiet, uh, so, but uh, it's always a good thing. Uh, 
what I'd like to, uh, there's been a lot of talk obviously about uh, the clinical aspects of the changes and that's right and proper that that, uh, that should be done. I just want to ask a few questions about the impact uh, on these changes to the workforce uh, from any new hospital that uh, is going to be built. Um, as you're all going to be aware, the Health Board is a significant employer in Pembrokeshire across the county, uh, but particularly the area I live in, Milford Haven, and I know colleagues in uh, sort of Dale Peninsula and the northwest of the county, uh, the uh, St. David's, uh, Fishguard, Goodick areas as well. So what I'd like to ask really is, um, has an assessment been made really of how many staff that are currently working at the Withybush site will be affected by any move to a new hospital because we have specialist medics, nurses and ancillary staff that, that will be significantly affected by that. Um, we also have a, a lot of low-waged uh, workers currently in the, uh, working at Withybush. And uh, so how uh, will they be affected? Why would they want to move to work to a new hospital that could be three quarters of an hour, an hour away in terms of travel time? And really what the impact on the work-life balance is going to be of those nurses and staff who may have to travel those distances before starting a shift in many cases and more concerningly um, after finishing what in some cases may be a 12-hour shift. Uh, because at the end of the day for me it's, it's great to think about recruiting uh, people into this area but we really very much have to look after the staff that we've currently got in this whole process. Yeah, I agree with you. And as I said earlier, we, we need to retain those staff. So we need to provide them with the hope uh, and inspiration that actually the new model would be good for them. Because uh, so it's not only about attracting new staff, it's keeping our current staff. And there will be some uh, key concerns among staff that you've mentioned about further to travel, etc. Will their will their job be there? And we, we do really need all the permanent staff we've got because we do have a lot of locum and agency staff. I think in terms of what's been, um, we, we are modeling it. We've done some modeling, but we're doing some extra work through, through the consultation process. And, you know, we'll need to do some very detailed work through the business planning uh, process. However, I would say a couple of things. At the staff event at Withybush, Bush, there was a nurse that I, I met there and talked about the cardiac cath lab, and they were dancing around the room. So they were excited about going to work in, in the new build with, with the new cardiac catheter lab because that was brilliant for them. There were others thinking, oh gosh, I work in outpatients, does that mean I have to move? No, because we're going to keep outpatients there. So I suppose there will be opportunities, I think, for everyone here to either stay locally, perhaps go and work in the community, be part of this new transformed community team, or work locally in Withybush Hospital, or potentially move if they've got that interest to the specialist unit. So I, I think for staff, there, there is a real win-win here. But we do need to think about their travel um, and not only for our, um, I would say for our patients, is, is um, public transport important? We're talking about the trains, buses, uh, potential duelling of the road. It, it will affect our staff as well. And some of our staff at the moment rely, get to work, walk to work, for example. So to get them, if they were going to go to the new site, actually public transport might become really important for our staff as well. So we're looking at all those, all those factors, but I think there'll be such a range of opportunities between the community working in Withybush, just thinking about the Withybush staff, or working in the unit, that there will be opportunities for people to pick. If you want to just say one bit. Just wanted to, to add some uh, assurance that we're working really closely with all of our local union uh, bodies around all the different professional groups and our um, support staff and lower uh, paid staff. As, um, as Phil said, we've done some very initial work around that, but we're hearing an awful lot through the consultation that is influencing the further work that needs to, to go on as well. And we're doing, as I said, we're doing that with our, all our unions as well. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Clare and the team from the Health Board um, for the presentation and for the detail of the answers. I think members do appreciate that. I think this session has been hugely beneficial, if, if something of a marathon. Um, and I thank members for the wide range of questions and the thoughtfulness of the questions. And I think they represent the concerns that our constituents have about these changes, which are, you know, they are a sort of once in a generation or once in a lifetime changes to the healthcare in Pembrokeshire. Um, I've just had a note that I'm afraid there's no time 
for the workshop. I'm not sure if anybody would have the energy for the workshop now. Um, and I just also had a note that uh, Sarah Jennings, who's the director of partnerships, would just like to say a few words. But thank you, members. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Clear. Thank you. And um, thank you. I'd echo at your comments, Chair, about the range and the breadth and the depth of the feedback. I suppose for me it's just a plea. Um, you are democratically elected um, officials and their members and therefore represent constituents who um, you're articulate with your voices. Our job is to make sure every voice gets heard and you, through you, you could have a huge impact on those who have quiet voices who would never come out and, and be able to say things easily, but you will be able to reach them through a whole range of ways. So um, I suppose it's just an, an, a plea from us that if um, you could encourage people to come to a public drop-in if they feel comfortable, if they could fill out the questionnaire, the questionnaire is absolutely vital. Because actually if people feel we, we are open to influence and we will have missed things, we won't have thought of things, we're hearing great things that we need to add in. If people can get it down onto the questionnaire, we can have a, a mandate to, to change things. The clinicians can take that on board and in what they propose back to board in September can take that on board. So that's really important. And if you could help do that, I think that would serve the population well. Um, and that's really all I wanted to say, unless Phil has another last word. He usually does. Okay, well, thanks again. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.